Guys, it's an absolute pleasure to have you once again at Swim with the Sharks, a special episode here at School of Sharks. It is an absolute pleasure. My name is Dan Diaz. I am your host. I'm excited to be here with you guys. So this is the first time that you uh, chime in. We want to welcome you. Um, big, big favor. We are using a service called StreamYard. So in order for us to know uh, who you are when you comment, and we want you to comment, just make sure that you give permission to StreamYard. Now, something that we like to do is we love to get to know our audience. Where are you from? So in the comment section, if you don't mind sharing what city, and if you're an active investor, uh, what is your specialty, whether it's the Burr method or owner finance or a rehab or a wholesaling, whatever it is. Now, what is School of Sharks? School of Sharks is a community that uh, really focuses on a simple philosophy. Alone, I can go fast. Together, I can go far, but united, we can go farther, faster. And that's really the point. When it comes to real estate investing, no one knows it all, nor does any one investor hold the monopoly on solutions and answers. While many uh, already share in various ways to various degrees, that platform is a way to bring the collective genius together as one mind. The goal is to help 100,000 lives in 1,000 days. And guys, I can't do this on my own. I need your help. So if you find value in sessions like today, please do me a favor, like and share to your individual walls. Feel free to tag me as well as the group and other real estate investing focus groups. Now, without further ado, we want to get to, uh, to, to the meat of uh, everything. Baskar, he says, is there a StreamYard link where we can give permission? Yes, there is somewhere in the post. There should be a way. Alma Flores got it, as well as you, Baskar, were able to do it. Uh, so we want to welcome everyone. Now, who is our guest for today? She's a very, very special lady. I want to go ahead and read her bio. She started in real estate in 2017, only a couple years ago. It's not like she's got 20, 30 years in the field, but in a few years after being a top closer at a construction company in Dallas, she got her license as a real estate agent, and she quickly fell in love with the investing side of things in real estate. Now, check this out, guys. Not to brag about her, but she did over 50 deals in the first two years on something that at least in San Antonio, I can't do because the heat kills me knocking on foreclosure doors. She quickly realized that there was a gap in the market for skilled transaction coordinators who knew the intricacies of resolving title issues and the paperwork involved in getting creative deals closed. So guess what? Lo and behold, Atlas Transaction Coordination Services was born. As an investor, she sat in just about every seat of the business. She understands how a high quality TC Transaction coordinator can increase operational efficiency without necessarily having them in-house. Her team has helped scale many investor operations across the nation, closing over 1,000 deals in the last two years while scaling from, she told me two, but let's be honest, we all start with ourselves only. So really scaling from one to 11 in just one year. Her team manages every type of transactions, including assignments, sub two, lease options, wraps, mobile homes, and novation. She's a problem solver with experience in solving messy title issues, customizing the transactional process with creative strategies, and growing a team while maintaining high standards of quality and service. Guys, without further ado, please welcome Casey Smith. The stage is yours. I don't think I've ever had such a like, you know, well read bio. I feel like you have a future in reading books or something. That's <laughs> impressive. Oh, wow. Sponsored by Bill Miller's. <laughs> Bill Miller's. So tell That's me on awesome. I appreciate that. But tell you on a little bit about yourself. Please, please go ahead and bring Yeah, thanks so much for uh, sitting on a busy day and, and joining in. Um, I really like to be open in these types of things because you rarely, um, we rarely stop to give each other advice, you know, in the everyday. So just appreciate anyone who's tuning in. Um, so yeah, honestly, you, you mentioned uh, we all start with ourselves. 
I feel like I've never been alone. Like there's always somebody. I don't think we get anywhere alone. You're right. We might start. I had I started with a partner, as most of you might know. Um, but you know, I think at the end of the day, uh, we always have someone around us showing us what we don't see about ourselves and giving us ideas on how to get involved in real estate and things like that. So yeah, I got I got started. I actually used to have a previous life as a media analyst in Zurich, a totally different life. Um, I actually have like a master's in politics and international relations. So I lived like nine lives. Um, but real estate actually is something that has had enough variety in it that has kept me going, um, working for myself. So it's definitely where I've landed and where I intend to be. So um, I've kind of experienced a lot of different areas of real estate and really feel like I'm starting to, um, in a short amount of time, <laughs> figure out what I love and don't love. Um, which I feel like everyone kind of goes down one path and might pivot or um, realize they love something or don't love something. So I'd love to help uh, the audience figure out what that is for them. Oh man, that's very, very nice. And I really love the spirit of generosity and, and, uh, and, and giving. You're one of the few sharks that I've actually met in person and we've interacted and guys, if, if you don't know this lady and, and she may not be super active on social media, I will tell you that, um, but she is definitely somebody worth uh, connecting to. Um, I think you'll, you'll understand on at least two, um, two levels. One, the fact that she can't help you with your transaction coordination, but the fact that she also has invaluable experience in, 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 in small areas that you might be, that you might be, you know, struggling with. So, that's kind of the, the, the point. Before we dive into the questions and really getting to know Casey, if you guys find value in, uh, in, in moments like these, please do me a favor, two favors, like and share to your personal walls. We'll invite people to the group, but also in the comment section, uh, introduce yourself. Let us know who you are, what's your market, and what's your specialty. So with that said, let's go ahead and start. Now, um, Casey, what would you say is, is your biggest strength as a business owner and uh, as an investor, what would you say is your biggest strength? Man, okay, so I used to think this was my biggest weakness, um, but I've realized that it's actually one of my greatest strengths. Um, I am one of those people that's highly adaptable. So I remember when I got into this industry, I got like tested in DISC. You know, a lot of people are familiar with the DISC testing. Yeah. And, um, I flatlined. I was like, now's the time I'm going to figure out what I'm best at. Like, I mean, I'm either going to like be an influencer or one of those things. And I like flatlined across the board. And I remember my mentor saying, I said, okay, well, what does this mean? What am I supposed to do? He said, anything you want. I said, dang it. That does not answer my question. Um, but I found out that that profile, what they call a chameleon or an adapter, um, is my greatest strength. Um, and I don't know if you recall this saying, but it's the jack of all trades is a master of none. But the full saying is actually a jack of all trade is a master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one. And we always leave that last part off because we definitely have to learn how to focus on something. But being an adapter for me has allowed me to pivot and um, adapt to situations like COVID or um, my wholesaling business, losing 70 grand in a week and figuring out how to you know, adapt and make it work. So for me, I think that's my greatest strength is that if you ever, uh, I'm also a maverick on the predictive index, which if you read the profile, it says undaunted by failure, which is hilarious because I've never thought about it. Um, but failure to me is just like, well, where did we go wrong and what can we fix and how do we tweak it to move forward? And I think as an entrepreneur, you have to be that person. You can't be somebody that breaks down because your process breaks down or somebody leaves your company or anything like that. You have to be the leader in adapting and figuring out what you need to do in order to make, to keep going. So I think that's something that's one of my, I don't do everything perfectly, but it's okay because I'm able to start and even doing the wrong thing is better than not doing anything. So for me, I'm able to adapt on the outcome of what I choose to move forward with. So it's kept me moving through a lot of stuff. Wow, that, that was really a, a golden nugget that you dropped, the importance of adaptability. And I really enjoyed how you, you found something that you previously thought uh, was a weakness and maybe if you saw it as a weakness, maybe it was, I don't know. But you were able to evolve it 
into a strength. And that's, that's a, that's a big, big lesson, big lesson. Thanks for sharing. Now it, it's not all, you know, a bed of roses. We do want to talk about your weaknesses. Um, I got I'd lots love of to, uh, I'd love to hear, what would you say is one of your most challenging weaknesses? One of my biggest weakness is I'm a doer. So I feel like I'm helping by jumping into things. Um, and I think a lot of people do this and I'm going to give you a little story about this because it's the best way I can illustrate it. I've said sure. it to a few people, but back in April, um, of this year, so we, I had grown my business. Um, I started hiring within the first year because I maxed out at about 150 active transactions and I wasn't wholesaling at the time because Atlas became a beast that I was keeping from eating me alive. Um, but I remember, um, in, in I had I had TCs. I was at this conference in Tennessee. I was working with some of my mentors, and one of my new hire TCs just decided to not show up to work on Monday. We had 54 closings in the next seven days, um, and I remember figuring out that she wasn't showing up, and there was absolutely zero person to jump in. My COO at the time was with me. And I remember staring at her and all I did was like, I'm gonna handle it. I grabbed my phone, I walked away and I took over 50 transactions, like just without even wow. consulting anybody, I just took over and I thought I was like the hero of the day. And I thought, you know, as a business owner, you gotta jump in. I had what I call a CTJ, a come into Jesus meeting with my mentors that night at dinner. They actually sat me down and said, uh, you did the wrong thing. And I was shocked. I thought, what do you mean I did the wrong thing? I jumped in, I handled it, I supported my team. And they were like, we all had bets that you would jump back in because they had, I had just gotten myself out of the business. In the in the day-to-day -day operational, I was delegating, which is super hard for a business owner, as we all know. And they said, you jumped back in, and now, congratulations, you're back in your business for a minimum of another three months. And I was shocked. I thought, wait a minute. <laughs> so. They pulled me back and they said, you should have let your COO handle it or you should have let somebody or you should have delegated or discussed it first and, and delegated it to your team rather than take over. So no, I did jump back in, um, I paid for it and we did close those deals but it took me actually uh, four to five months to get back out of that position. So mm -hmm. I learned a really big lesson that day and I think a lot of people do this, they think they're helping um, but you're stepping on toes you're confusing the lines of process. Um, you're not empowering your team. So it was assigned to me to read the book Multipliers after I did that. If anyone has read that book, <laughs> um, it was like the one book I needed that year and I learned that I did do the wrong thing. Um, and my, my person at the time was like, you know, I, I figured it out. I should have told you, give me 15 minutes because most, most visionaries, right? Like we, we, we act quick. Um, we jump in and we act. But some people need to think through their processes. And if you're hiring them to take care of operational stuff, you have to trust their process too and allow them to come up with a solution and implement it and empower them to do so. So that when you do have problems arise, you can trust the team to handle it just like you would. So that's a weakness of mine and I do it all the time and I have to catch myself and pull Man, back. Man, that is that is powerful. powerful. I mean, that's really powerful. Too. <laughs> well, I mean, it was so but it was, but it uh, was uh, you, know, you know, absolutely powerful, absolutely powerful because, 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 you know, you know, something that you, something did, that you did for, for what, a couple of hours, maybe uh, all day, all day, pushed you back for months, for months. And, and it was pain. Sure. Maybe not the income, you know, maybe not, but, but the goal that you were achieving, which is, Hey, I'm going to be focused on growing my team. Well, now you were mm -hmm. doing a job again. You know, yeah, and, and that uh, that really hurt. Wow, that's 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 powerful, powerful. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Casey and some of your uh, personal and most proudest moments and accomplishments. Now, if you're comfortable talking outside the business, you're more than welcome to. This is really where I want the audience to get to know uh, you. What would you say is one of the accomplishments that you are most proud of? Yeah, so I'll get super vulnerable here because um, I think it's important that when you go into this world, um, you quickly realize that the lines between your personal life and your business life no longer exist um, as much as we want them to. Um, it kind of bleeds in. And a lot of people, a lot of us make this choice to take this path for the quote freedom. 
um, that it gives us. But a lot of people don't ask that question about what does freedom look like to you, um, and 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 what does it mean? I think we start to like all of my friends do real estate at this point. We eat, sleep, and breathe it. We do life together. So those lines got blurred super quickly, but we also love it. So it's not a strain. Um, I'd say my biggest accomplishment is how I pivoted. Um, a lot of people know me as starting out as investing in a wholesale operation um, with my former partner slash ex-husband. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just, everyone knows. Um, and we definitely work together a lot on this stuff. Um, I would say my greatest accomplishment was we had, um, gosh, we found a glitch in our marketing back in 2019. It was really subtle. It was, we just realized that the our service that we were using for SMS was suppressing things in a certain way that what we thought was being distributed wasn't. It's a long story, but which I'm happy to explain later. Um, but anyway, uh, we had a bunch of deals on the table and like anything and everything went wrong. I'm talking like 70 grand that we were supposed to get that week just fell apart. And to, to wow. know ours, it was just a minor things that added up. Um, I was also really stressed out sitting in every seat and I realized that I, needed my own kind of thing because I never wanted to grow an operation or a, a wholesale business. I just kind of felt a little pushed into it. Um, so I had the idea for Atlas and so many people told me it wouldn't work. So many people. Everyone said, well, people would just go in house and all the sorts of things. And then guess what happened? About four months later, it was COVID. <laughs> COVID hit. Um, about four months after I had started this and I was just going through a divorce. So I um, had all of these personal things coming at me in every direction. Um, a lot of things we had to untangle um, and I grew at, not only did we grow that year, but we thrived. Like I, it was the most amazing thing. I worked 15 hour days um, and it was very rough. But I'm really proud that I woke up every morning when I didn't want to um, and when I had so much going on and I heavily leaned on my mentors. Again, you don't get anywhere by yourself. Um, but I'm really proud of what we built during one of the most historic things that happened in our lifetime. And when businesses were shutting down, when people had to pivot their operation, we created a virtual option for people that didn't exist before. So I'm really proud of myself for doing that and for showing up every day and building it to what we did. I don't do a lot of things perfectly, but I would say um, that's probably one of my biggest ones. Yeah, that's um, that I think is going to be something that you're going to be proud for, you know, years or decades. Years or decades. Yeah. That your business, through your direction and your leadership, grew during one of the darkest, you know, times in I don't know at least the last 10, 15 years or, or yeah. longer. Yeah. You know, so good job, good good job for that. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, what, what it is that you enjoy most as a business owner and uh, and as an investor. And I'm sure there's a lot of things. That's why you're here. That's why we do what we do. Um, but what would you say is one of your greatest enjoyments when it comes to being a business owner and, and an investor overall? I I call it the yellow brick road. Um, I. I think this is the most daunting, grinding, um, emotional experience that I've ever been through um, because life doesn't stop, but you're also accountable to so many people and you're solely responsible for your own well being and your growth and all these things. And I remember when, you know, everyone always says, find your why because that's what keeps you going. I'll be super honest to anyone out there in the audience who says, I don't know what it is, it's okay. <laughs> you don't have to know it. Um, I still don't know it. I'll be super honest. I don't know my why. Um, but I can tell you this, that I, the reason that I, I do this and that I've actually been self-employed now for about five or six years, six years now, six years. Um, and I realized that the reason I love this so much is because you develop so much self-awareness along the journey and so much um, growth you're constantly learning. Um, you're connecting with people. You have to be vulnerable. Um, you've got to adapt and change and shift and face problems and solve problems at an exponential rate. I, you know, I think a lot of us can kind of get into routine, but there's not a lot of routine when you're building a business yourself. There just isn't. Um, you might get there someday, but there, it's very hard. 
Um, you wake up to fires, you go to bed to, with fires, and you're learning all the while, right? You're like, how do I handle this? Um, and the entrepreneur's job is to think. You know, we have a certain ability that a lot of people don't. And so our, our real strength is solving problems. So for me, the yellow brick road, the actual journey is what keeps me going, what I love so much about it, because I've learned more about myself and people and politics and law and all sorts of things than I have and, and in school, in grad school, in anything else. So I think I just love that we fix things about ourselves faster <laughs> or we're at least aware of them faster. Um, we get to know ourselves better. We get to know ourselves around people. I don't think you can truly know yourself until you're in community um, where you start to kind of meet people that are different than you and learn how to lead them. So I love everything about that process. Um, I just, as an example, this year, um, I usually read quite a few books. Um, I usually read 50 to 60 a year this year. I've probably read five um, because I've tried, I've, you can only read so much. I've really tried to e experience what I'm doing with my team and talk to other people who have already done it and do real world, real world learning. Um, because, you know, there's a lot of books out there that can show you how to do things, but I really enjoy the actual process of, of figuring things out. And so that's what I like about it. Wow. The wow. yellow, the yellow brick road. Brick road. Like you got to learn to love the yellow brick road or <laughs> it's going to be a long journey for you. Yeah. <laughs> for yeah. sure. And I agree yeah. with you. And I agree a with you. A lot of business, business owners, business owners, we, we might have a goal. We, we might have, have, goal. have the end result in mind, but usually the way we're driven, even if we get it, when we get it, we're just going to continue. We're going to find a new goal. We're going to find a new destination. We're going to find a new place to go. Um, mm -hmm. so, so you're absolutely right. We, we fall in love many times with the journey. Um, not, not necessarily, you know, the, uh, the, the goal guys, this is absolute gold. We're super, super happy to have Casey. If you guys find value, um, not just in, in, in this podcast, but in school of sharks in general and, and in us bringing on board, super, super experienced people, please do me a favor, like, and share. Uh, the uh, live feed that's going on today to your personal walls. Feel free to tag me. Feel free to tag Casey. Uh, feel free to tag School of Sharks. Uh, we'd love to know that you guys are, are, are involved. Invite your friends uh, to come and join us again. We can't impact 100,000 lives in 1,000 days if, uh, you know, if, if you don't help us along the yellow brick road, you know, along the yellow brick road. That's, uh, that's the point. We're not over. Um, I, I do recall when we were preparing uh, this, um, this, this kind of presentation, we talked about a, a deal uh, or a situation that really meant a lot to you. And I don't know if you're comfortable kind of sharing it with the audience, but um, if, if you're okay, I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, that, that one deal. Uh, I think it was one or two deals that we talked about that, that really stand out in your mind uh, as memorable. I have so many. I don't even know where to begin. There's like, there's like the transacting side and then there's the investor side, but well, that's uh, all. I'll give you, I'll give you a couple. Um, because your, I think your role in them matters, and and the power that you have in your role also matters. So don't be afraid to bring people in um, <laughs> to help you with these problems. So one of them was when I was um, actually uh, we were purchasing a property to flip. It was over in White Settlement. Um, so this was actually something numbers looked great. It was a guy in foreclosure. I stopped his foreclosure. Um, it's actually just a random, there are so many ways to stop a foreclosure, truly. Um, but this particular situation, even though we stopped it, uh, apparently the county didn't get the memo. And so I'm thinking we're in the clear, we're ready to close in a couple of days. And I get a call at 7.30 in the morning from the seller, freaking out. He is panicked, I'm panicked. I immediately just had this like fire inside me, like what's the problem? Um, and he said that his house got sold at auction. If you've never stopped a foreclosure and been told your house sold at auction, you don't know what to do and you've never done it before, you're going to panic a little bit. So I, <laughs> I was like, well, how do you know it was sold? Because this would have been, this was the next morning. And I thought, there's no way you would have known that soon. Well, sure enough, he was still in the property, of course, because we hadn't closed yet. And apparently the woman who bought it from the auction knocked on his door and actually went to him and said, hey, I bought your house. You need to get out. So you can imagine he's trusted me during this process. I told him his auction was stopped and this stranger is telling him his house is sold. So lucky for me, 
she left her phone number with him. And um, I told him, I said, let me let me figure this out. Actually, the first thing I did is I, I, call, I called a colleague of mine and I said, have you ever had this happen to you? He had done several deals um, and he's quite big now. And he was like, oh, no big deal. It's a pain to reverse it, but you can reverse it. So I already had a sense of calm because I was like, okay, it's obviously a mistake. We can reverse it. Um, my partner ends up calling the woman who bought the house and said, and we, we got this house for about 180,000, something around then, around there. ARV was way higher. She bought it at auction for, I think, around 204,000. And we were planning on flipping this property or 205,000, I think, something around there. And if you, if you know when you buy it from auction, you don't have to do closing costs and things like that because it's just a different way to purchase, right? So your numbers look a little bit differently. So we called her and we said, well, what if we sold it to you for a little cheaper than you bought at auction? Because to us, to flip the property, we would have made just the same amount of money wholesaling it. So we had a moment where we're like, well, why put in the work to flip it when we can just wholesale it? So my partner had called her and sure enough, she bought the deal for a grand less so at 204000 we covered the closing costs for her and we ended up making more money than we would have in a shorter amount of time. So we reversed the auction. We ended up selling to her anyway in a different way. And she ended up buying two or three more houses from us. So we converted her as an auction buyer to one of our private buyers. Um, she, I think she was, they were doctors somewhere, like someone I never would have come across in any shape or form. So we ended up turning her into a buyer. We closed the deal and everything got done. So that was super memorable because we really flipped it and was able to make a, a good situation out of it. Man, that's, that's amazing. So help me understand a little bit of the dynamics. Did it in fact get sold at the foreclosure auction? It did, but it wasn't a valid sale because we had explain why. Um, because we actually had we had documentation that they had stopped it from the lender, um, and we just went and showed them the documentation. I'll be super honest; the details of how we transacted the reversal escaped me because that would have been three or four years ago, I think, at this point. Um, um, but. Most of the time, if you did transact a deal and you, your lender and your sub trustee can confirm it, like they can tell you on the phone or put it in writing. It doesn't mean that the county or whoever what the trustee was is actually pulling it from the docket at the, count, the county steps. Mm. So there's been a lot of situations where I've got a deed or like we reinstated and then have the seller sign the deed over, but I didn't trust that it got done in time where I've shown up, found the trustee, showed them the document, and they scratch it from the list right then and there. So if you ever are unsure if, if the process went through, even if you got confirmation, show up at the county steps on auction day and find auction.com or whoever is actually holding it. The trustees are always there um, and they'll have a list and you can just bring the paperwork to show them that it's been reinstated or that you own the deed and that they're no longer, that the sale has been completed and they'll literally cross it and remove it from the docket. So to reverse it, it's just a similar thing. It's just showing them that it's already been handled or stopped um, and it reversed it and then you can go forward in your normal closing. Wow. So for those of you who don't know today, it's Texas Tuesday, you know, that's when actions are happening. Tuesday. It is. Just <laughs> oh, it's, so many people stressed out right now, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, Bear County alone, I think there was about 430 uh, homes yeah. uh, for auction. I'm sure Dallas, Fort Worth, maybe two or three times. Mm -hmm. so, I don't know. They do it basically like they'll have a starting time, but it doesn't have, you don't know when the property is coming up. So I have r ran, I'm talking full on run to the count, to the county court house to make sure it's not been sold so many times I can't even count anymore. So it's, it's a, it's a personal thing. I wish, and it's just a personal thing. And if anyone ever in the audience now or in the future hears my humble words and can make it happen, that would be great. I think that a field trip that every high schooler in America should do is to the county courthouse footsteps on whenever the auctions occur and witness that this happens. Because I've encountered so many people that say they're not going to take my house away. Well, they like, do. Yeah, on a monthly basis. In in San Antonio, one hundred Dolorosa. Go check it out every first Tuesday of the month in Texas. So, anyways, <laughs> that's just my thing. I, I I wish there was like high school field trips. Like, yeah, you need to pay your bills. You need to pay the mortgage. You're going to leave your the house if you don't. 
<laughs> no, they will. They will take and they will not think twice about it. That is true. They will. They will not think about it. Was there another one that you wanted to share? Because I know you, you. You said there was a couple. Man, should I tell about the gun on my notary or yes. the smoker? <laughs> Let's talk about the gun one. The importance of memorandums of contract. So we ventured up into Grayson County in the Sherman area, which we hadn't done a lot in. Um, that's a whole nother realm of humans. Um, we had gotten this house under contract. I We both had made several trips to the house. It was a very elderly lady, but she had a lot of kids. The house was a dump, just not taken care of, but it was definitely, it had potential. So. We ended up, uh, we had, I think we were probably about to make 20 grand on this deal. Um, we ended up having a showing. We had a buyer show up um, who wanted the house. We made the deal, did the assignment. Everything was great. We got a notary to the house. And I'm thinking, sweet, we're going to put this one in that we have a closing today. All I, I get a call from the notary who's frantic, not from the notary. It was actually from my closer, my escrow officer. And she was like, oh, we have a problem. Apparently the notary is terrified. And I guess a son, one of the sons had pulled a gun on the notary and basically said to get lost. We're not, she's not selling her house. Now the mother was very elderly and had a heart condition and heart issues. So her kids had been feuding about her selling it. And she had, she had initially intended to move closer to the hospital so that she could be cared for. But her kids didn't want her to sell the house and it was clearly like a central point for them. I think they had grown up in the house and things like that. Um, I don't really know the dialogue that had happened, but yeah, she sure enough left and we never got that deal back. They never picked up the phone and we had built great rapport with them. So you never know when like a family member or a friend is gonna come in and just blow up the deal. Everybody, we had gotten two of the daughters and the mom on board. I didn't even know this kid existed. Um, and yeah, I still, to this day, I filed a memo on that property because I had a feeling like it was a little shaky. I'm still sitting on it to this day. So we'll see how that goes because we were ready to close and uh, good to go. So that was a super fun one. And there's nothing you can do like at all. No, no people are <laughs> extremely unpredictable. Um, now, you kind of touched on something that I, I, if you don't mind, I'd love to to dig a little deeper. You confidently did a memo for, for those of in the audience who might not be aware. Do um, you want to explain real quick what, what doing a memo yeah. is? Contract or we call them MOCs, memorandum of addendum. There's lots of different terms for them, but all it does is um, it's a notarized document signed by me and it has all my company info, my contact information and everything that basically says that I'm ready, willing and able to buy this property and that we're, we have a contract on the property. Um, I don't do them on all my properties, but I do them when I feel like my deal is shaky and when I'm prepared to close on it. So even if my buyer falls through, I'm always prepared to close on it. Um, because you know, you can falsely file, file these and it will come back to bite you in the butt. And that's uh, exactly, that's exactly, exactly what, I what I wanted to talk, wanted about. To talk about. Yeah. There's a few, there's a few people, people out there that talk that about talk just about institutionally, institutionally you know, putting, um, you know, memorandums on every deal that you do as a wholesaler, but it's super, super important that you only do it. Go ahead and say that again. When you are what? Willing and able and ready to buy when you can if your buyer falls through that you're ready to fund that deal 100% you have to be ready because you're clouding title on a property and if your buyer falls through and they come back around and you're still not ready um, it could really come back at you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Wow, man. I super, super you love that. Who want to know why I sit on it. It's because I was ready and even now I would buy it. It was a good deal. Um, and if not, then I'll release the memo. So if, if, so one day, whenever they decide to sell, if they do, um, and they pull title, it's going to come up as a cloud on title. It's going to show that my company has, this is going to have my contact info. They can call me directly and I can either negotiate a release for a fee or I can sign the release for nothing. It's up to me. Um, so at the time, so I can decide if I don't really, you know, I can decide either way what it would cost and they can decide to pay me at closing or not. So you can make a few thousand. I've actually signed a release of a memo on another situation where he signed a contract with three other people. Um, <laughs> this is the infamous poop house that a lot of people know that I contracted. The guy had no water for like uh, 10 years. 
and he was he decided to screw over the bank by defecating in his own house so it was covered in human feces like you couldn't even see the floor there was a puppy with him and i thought is this dog poop and then i took one step inside and backed right out and i was like oh no that is human feces um he signed a contract with three other people um and then he ghosted us at the last minute we also had a buyer we were also ready to close and anyway we had a memo on that property and he his house ended up getting sold at auction and we then got served a lawsuit from the seller um, for clouding title. Well, turns out I knew the attorney. So I pick up and I call the attorney and I said, I, I don't know why I'm being sued. I, all of my information is publicly recorded on the memo in the county. Whoever this investor is that ended up trying to purchase the house clearly has to be new because they didn't know to contact me. Um, and they're trying to, they're believing his story to sue. So we said, we, we told the attorney, we would release the memo on the condition that the investor called me personally so we could show them a few things they did incorrectly and then we would go ahead and sign it so that they would learn for the future so we actually ended up releasing it for like a couple hundred bucks we didn't wow. we did we work hard lined on that one and we said in the future you have a copy of the memo when it clouds title you can call that person and you can negotiate the release but she didn't know how to do that so it actually did get auctioned because she didn't have the knowledge to get it to the closing table prior to Wow, wow, super. The lawsuit super was dropped. I'm real anyone. proud. I'm 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 real proud that really shows, you know, ethics. Um I, I think a lot of uh, investors and wholesalers might have just clinched to it and, and and say, you know, I I need to get paid. Have you ever had a situation where you have a seller who wants to back out? You know, they tell you they want to back mm -hmm. out. And you have to kind of quasi educate them on um what exactly will happen if they decide to go elsewhere? Yeah, that happens a lot. You know, <laughs> situation where it's a personal thing, like, I don't know, maybe it's a health related issue or a lot of stuff has come out. It really depends on the situation, but I do educate them when I feel like they're just being unreasonable. Or if you've been in this long enough, especially if you're in sales, you can kind of read people a little bit better. And you know, if they're trying to just get out, like I always say, you're not uncovering the real objection. Um, I had a situation with my transaction company where a very new investor, um, I won't mention names, um, was doing a deal and she calls me the day of closing and says, um, you didn't get the extension signed. And I said, I'm sorry, what? And so I call the TC and I think I like dig into this, this property and it turns out, I don't remember the reason why they extended, but I, I'm virtual. I cannot force the hand of a seller to sign. We can call them. We can let them know we can't get a hold of them. But at the end of the day, they didn't sign the extension. So the bottom line was, was that the seller wanted to get out of the deal and said, well, we're past close date. I don't have to sign. And the reason he wanted to get out of it, whatever the real reason was, he said he didn't want to pay the taxes that were due. And his bottom line wasn't what he thought it would be. So I said, the extension's not the problem. The problem is his bottom line. And it was a matter of $250. Oh this is it, $250 was the issue. And, I, and she said, well, you, you didn't get it signed. It's your fault. And I said, I asked her, I said, how, I just had curiosity, like how many deals have you been through? Because you haven't uncovered the real objection because it's not that big of a cost maybe you should just eat the cost of $250. She said, well, why should I do it? The title company should reduce their fees. I was like, why would the company reduce their fees? Why would I reduce my fee? And she said, because I said, I think that you haven't. You're back. I'm back. Okay. I was like, happens all the time. It's raining. So who knows? Um, anyway, long story short is that the real objection from the seller was his bottom line. It wasn't that something was signed or done in a timely manner. It, it had to be a win-win situation for him. So I was prepared to eat that cost myself. Um, but at, at the end of the day, we ended up resolving it. But I think when a seller wants to get out of something, I told that investor, unfortunately, I wasn't the one, I wasn't the principal in the deal. So I was trying to advise the investor that it it's, your job to uncover the real objection as to why they're trying to pull out the deal. And it's also your job to educate them as to why it didn't close. Because if you had the right contract that covered, like he was actually the one that wasn't performing or somebody wasn't doing something in a timely manner, whether it wasn't the payoff or something wasn't cleared in time. Um, 
you know, a lot of people have those types of extensions built into their contracts and some don't. So I think that you really, if somebody's trying to pull out of a deal, you got to really find out why. And then if you have to do a strong arm and say, we are in a legally binding contract and there are consequences, it works sometimes and it doesn't others, but we've also explained to them the complications of going to sell it in the future if we do have an MOC on it and they're trying to ghost us for no reason um, because they'll try to make up every excuse in the book and chances are that there was another investor that came in with a higher offer and they're trying to get out. So you wanna flesh that out without killing the deal and then also politely tell them, listen, we had a deal we need to honor that deal. I'm ready to close, are you? And if not, there might be financial repercussions. Well, you're gonna get even less. And we've actually gone through that process with sellers and it's worked. Um, not that you wanna threaten them because they're already in a sensitive situation, but you know, there are, they're in a legally binding contract. I mean, and you have to just be prepared to close or explain to them what will happen if not, and if you're gonna pursue it or not, make sure it's worth your time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. See if the, uh, See if the uh, uh, what is it? A buddy of mine, he says, is the juice worth the squeeze? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You got to really figure that out. Oh man, that's, that's awesome. Um, Hey, listen, we um, are having a really, really good time. I super appreciate, you know, the time that you're with us guys. If you guys are digging the content, uh, please share this podcast on your personal, uh, on your personal walls and invite people uh, to the group. We're not done. Um, we know that many of our listeners are either very new, either haven't done their first deal or uh, maybe have, have done just a few deals. So we really want to talk to you guys at this moment. And, and Casey, if you don't mind, I'd love for you to, to hone in on this group of people and maybe share some words of, of wisdom, some overall words of wisdom that maybe they can uh, take home with them. Yeah, so my favorite thing to talk to newer people about is you've probably learned there's so much information out there. There's so many people on social media that have run very successful um, businesses. But one mistake I personally made when I started out was I saw someone successful and I tried to mimic their blueprint, right? I, or paid a lot of money to gurus prior to Propelio existing and other <laughs> resources a few years ago. Um, and I think it's really important to understand that we're all different and we all have different skill sets. So start with knowing yourself first. You have to know what you're good at. You have to know how you think. You have to know what your goals are. Know what freedom means to you. Um, my favorite story is from Gary Harper who talks about freedom for him was being able to cover his bills without stress. And that was only like five grand a month. That was freedom for him. That was actual freedom. Now, abundance and things come after that. But I love that story because freedom could be just getting enough assets to pay off your student loan or just enough assets to pay your major bills so that you have the freedom to create or to go do what you love best. But you have to know yourself first. So I would say um, not everybody has to create a wholesaling business. Not You know, there's so many ways to make money in real estate so many you could be service-based you could be um just an operation where you're buying you're, you're purchasing for yourself while you're in another job um you don't have to follow the whole blueprint that other people do um so that's the biggest wisdom i would take the second piece is it's not just about learning about real estate you can learn sales techniques you can learn um about taxes all that kind of stuff but if you do want to create a business and you're not just doing it for your own portfolio, get a business mentor that actually teaches you how to build a business, not just real estate. Um, people that can teach you how to lead people, how to create um, employees versus contractors, write contracts, um, how to hire, how to organize yourself, how to train people, because a lot of people get into this and they want to get to 10, 20 deals a month and they don't realize, congrats, you're running a business. And there's two sides to it. There's the operational and there's the running of the business. If you're not somebody that likes to lead people, that might not be the route for you. I work with about 40 different investment operations nationwide. And I can I see this all the time. They've started small, made a ton of money, then scaled, made less money and went back down because they're like, I like it here. I don't have to manage a ton of people. I have bigger splits. 
And so a lot of people vacillate between those sizes of companies and deals. And so just be mindful that volume doesn't necessarily mean more money. You can actually spend your, your time on finding bigger spreads and have a lot less work on the back end. It just depends about your patience and, and your diligence in getting it done. You don't have to just quit your job right out the gate. You can do this on the side too. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that. I like that the, the part we're yeah, sharing, part that, is, sharing is, that it's, it's you don't have to follow someone else's path. Someone else's path. Mm -hmm. You don't have to follow their yellow brick road. You can yeah. find your own yellow brick road, and, and it may not necessarily be in like the traditional wholesaling, burring, um, you know, fix and flip. Uh, you you found a, a tremendous uh, wealth of opportunity in in something that is only one part of of the real estate transaction. You know, yeah. and I. I find that inspiring. I mean, I, I really, really do find that, you know, inspiring. And I bet I could be wrong, but I bet that just because of the network that you build, you end up landing some really great deals. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know me personally, the first thing you should have seen the look on their face when I talked about doing a transaction coordinating, every single one of them are like, why would you do that to yourself? They're like, why like you're you're a salesperson i said trust me i don't love it but i saw a niche for it and i just thought i know how it works i've sat in that seat i know what it takes and i just designed it that was also using my visionary side of me and then i just hired it out so you can find um little things and then pass it off and quite frankly i couldn't find anyone to hire so i just trained a bunch of people and now they do my own deals too but what people didn't realize was when I told them, I said, do you realize that I get hundreds of deals before they hit title nationwide? And then their light bulb went off. And I was like, just saying, like, I can, I have more eyes on deals than anyone else. And I definitely have a relationship with my clients. So when I am ready to start purchasing again, which I am now, I can cherry pick if I wanted or go to my client and say, hey, I'd really like to buy this from you. And so you, there are so many ways you can get access or partner with people that is more than just being on their buyers list. You can start to do business with them. You can start to build a relationship with them by your own skill set, um, get to know each other's character and network, and you'd be surprised at how you can find deals. We always joke in Dallas that like deals are a phone call away. So if you're not building those relationships, you're probably missing out on a lot um, or even just creating a service. Like I think you mentioned earlier, Hey, if you're good at photography, offer to go do their listings. Then you're taking photos before they even sell it to their, send it to their buyers list. Like there's so many ways if you're prepared to do it. And it's just a win-win. There's wholesalers who talk about doing their first deal finally because they realize, and guys, I cannot stress this enough. If you talk to any experienced person who wholesale, they always say one thing. I wish I started purchasing and cherry picking earlier. Don't get addicted to the transactional big checks. Take the risk, prepare yourself, get pre-qualified, get your finances in order so that when the deals come, you can pick what you want and sell the rest. Wholesaling doesn't have to be the end all be all. It can just be a tool to get you to where you wanna be. And also, whenever you do have to file those memos, they can be 100% legitimate memos because if circumstances yeah. come, you yeah. can show that you have willingness and ability and are ready to close on that deal if you're not able to assign it. Yep. Yeah, I tell people all the time, you have to learn to buy. And, and uh, they're, they're nothing against, against wholesalers who are only wholesaling, but a true investor cannot really claim that title until they actually have their names on deals. That's just something I believe. You have to have your name on papers. You have to have your name on, on, on titles. You have to own real estate and be responsible for it to some degree. Um, and, and, and you have to learn how to buy, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that's part of what we teach at school of sharks, learn to buy. You don't have to have money. We all know that, but, but learn yeah. how to buy, learn how to buy, you know, for sure. Um, I, I want to hone down a little bit on the, the specifics. So is there any practical advice that you can maybe share with the group, uh, for, for some horse trading and maybe some tips, some tricks that, that can kind of help them guide you know, maybe their day or their week or, or their activities? I have so many. I honestly, I made a whole list, Dan, and I was like, I don't even know like where to begin. Um, I, 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 so that really made me successful personally was 
I, I learned how to do, I learned the role of people in this industry. So for example, title companies. A lot of people think title companies are what close your deals. <laughs> now there are some great ones out there. Don't get me wrong, I can name a few. Um, but it's not their job to clear title. I don't know if people know this, but your title companies are like insurance companies. Their job is to underwrite the policy and choose if it's insurable or not, just like anything else. So their job is to show you what has to be cleared and what's insurable and not insurable. And you have to decide whether you're okay making an exception to those difficult things or solving them and clearing them. Now, a lot of title companies assist with that and are wonderful with it, um, but you'd be surprised at how much of it is office policy and not property code. Um, so you've got to learn intricacies of property code. A very good case in point is Texas has very strong homestead laws that can go in your favor. <laughs> um, so little things like liens and homesteads um, you know, you can have them sign affidavits. Now, some title companies will do this and some won't. Um, it just depends on what they're willing and who their underwriters are. So always kind of push back and ask the right questions to figure out what they'll accept and not accept. And I think you'll realize that your job, the reason you make the money you do is because you're a problem solver. We always say that, but it's in your hands to solve the problem. And so learn, learn about liens, learn about, um, what you can clear and what you can't. There's great classes out there where you can learn about um, expiration dates on liens and UCC liens and all the things that come up that we deal with, um, which states have to do probate versus affidavit, things like that. And you might be surprised um, at what you can accomplish um, and do yourself without the help of the title company. Um, a really, I'll, I'll share a really practical resource that has helped me clear a lot of deals. It's something called Payoff Assist. Um, mm -hmm. Since 2008, a lot of lenders have gone out of business and not all of them were FDIC insured. So I'm sure a lot of you out there have run into past mortgages where you, even from a previous owner that you have no contact with, you can actually go to payoffassist.com. It's super cheap. I can't remember how much it costs, but it's cheap. And you can actually research lenders and figure out who acquired them and, and follow the rabbit trail. And so you can find the actual lender that holds it and get your satisfaction because a lot of them didn't file the satisfactions like they were supposed to or the releases like they were supposed to. And so this will help you track it down and get what you need. Now, if they are FDIC insured, you can actually go to FDIC and request a payoff and it takes probably twice as long as any other lender. But just know that you can get payoffs through them if they are insured. If not, payoff assist is great for you to call them, track it down by social security numbers and things like that. Um, Dan, we were talking earlier about payoffs, but we get authorizations right out the gate. I get an authorization. Um, it's a one pager. It's signed with the social security of the seller. You fax it into a lender and then you can call in and you're authorized or you can get them on the phone as at like a three way and the seller can verbally authorize you for a certain amount of time. And then you can call and ask the questions and get the payoffs or the reinstatements as you need them to close your deals. But that's a big hurdle we run into a lot. So it's a great resource for you. That's, That's a very awesome. And, and, it's, and it's payoffassist.com? Payoffassist.com. Nice, nice. It's nice, really, nice. it's been helpful. Nice, nice, nice. Well, Casey, we've really had a great time. I, I want to express my, my gratitude and appreciation, not just for your friendship, but for taking the time to uh, be here today. I imagine on Texas Tuesday, you probably had better things to do. Um, but you know, thank you. Thank you so much. You know, for apparently I built my team to handle the chaos pretty well because nobody's bothered me. So this is a good sign. <laughs> That's <laughs> a very sign. good. That's a very, very good sign. Now, now guys, those of you guys who are listening, um, as you guys know, at school of sharks, we are not just bringing Casey on, uh, for a few minutes, but we we've, we've asked her to really go above and beyond and, and starting on Friday, she's going to be posting a series of, uh, of, of sort of um, help, self-guided or challenges or posts that are really geared towards helping uh, helping your business. Now, here's a little bit of a preview. On, on Friday, she's going to be giving all of us homework. She's going to be sharing one thing to help get our mind right over the weekend and perhaps strengthen our family, our outlook, or our happiness. Now, it is going to be a challenge, which means that if you accept that challenge, you have to 
say yes in the comments. I don't know what that challenge is, but stay tuned for that. On Saturday, she's going to be posting um, a, a, a story relating to a challenge or a lesson that she recently had, and more importantly, how she overcame it. So you want to stay tuned for that. Sunday, she's going to be sharing one thing to help us jumpstart the week and perhaps um, you know, kind of get us in, in, in the right in the right place. Because, uh, guys, whether you know it or not, our weeks do not begin on Monday. They usually begin on Sunday. So <laughs> Sunday, you need to prep the week. So what does Casey do? She's going to let us know. It's going to be in the form of a challenge. So those of you who choose to accept that challenge, um, she's, she's got something, something great for us. On Monday, she's going to post a one or two negotiation tools or scripts that really have helped her and, and can help all of us uh, when it comes to talking to sellers or buyers or perhaps different people of the, uh, of the transaction coordination. And finally, on Tuesday, she's going to be sharing some tips to help us uh, boost our, our business. So guys, if you found value, I'm going to say it like one more time. Please do me a favor. Do School of Sharks a favor. Do yourselves a favor. Like, share this content. Um, share it on your personal feed. Please go ahead and tag me, tag School of Sharks, tag Casey, and uh, we, we really want to, um, you know, do, do business together. Remember our motto at School of Sharks, alone you may go fast, together we can go far, but united we can go farther, faster. So Casey, do you have one last words for, for the audience before going ahead and end the broadcast? Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, you guys, the group that... Dan has built, I can personally say, help me get me to where I am. I know a lot of them personally. Um, I always say that the only reason I've been able to accomplish what I did, and it's not much compared to a lot of people, is standing on the shoulder of giants, and they're in this group. Um, it's the most giving group I've ever known. I've worked with a lot of them, and they are so willing to pay it forward. So don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, don't be scared to be a beginner. Don't be scared to be new. Um, because it's, don't, ha don't be scared to have humility in asking the dumb questions because there is no dumb question. There's 10 different ways to do things. And a lot of people have had success and learned lessons. So if anything, just like this group, share this group, bring people into this group, um, and ask the questions and engage because you're going to learn a lot. Um, be specific. It's not just mindset. There's a lot of practical advice here as well from people who have a lot of experience. Um, and we are all sharing what we've known from others as well. So it's a ripple effect for sure. Um, and take advantage of it. There's not a lot of people that would take the time to share the way Dan has um, with these people. So thank you so much for letting me pay it forward, Dan. I really, it means a lot to me and uh, looking forward to doing more deals, especially with the people in this group. I'm in Dallas. Call me. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and just in case anyone got the message, you are available nationwide, correct? I am. Yeah, we're nationwide. So we've got a network nationwide. So if you need title recommendations or you need help moving a deal, we've actually connected a lot of people. I just connected a friend in Dallas who had a deal in South Carolina and one of my buddies bought it just because I know he was in that market. So you never know who people love know. It. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much, Casey, for, for being here. Um, the last words of encouragement that I want to leave everyone with comes from John Maxwell. He says, the greatest day in your life and mine is when we take total and complete responsible for our attitudes. That's the day we truly grow up. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much, Casey. You guys have a great one. Bye-bye.